Today, at the request of the committee chair, I will focus upon the, the exposure resulting from the compromise of records that place personally identifiable information, commonly known as PII, of our nation's veterans, federal employees, and millions of other Americans at risk. In the past year alone, OIG investigators and auditors have performed work specific to the following. The loss of a computer hard drive from Archives 2 in College Park populated with millions of records from the Clinton White House. Within this population are tens of thousands of records containing PII as well as other potentially sensitive information. The loss of government control over a hard drive we suspect contained millions of PII records of our nation's veterans. Inappropriate controls over information stored in the automated case management system used in St. Louis to track and process electronic mail-based requests for official military personnel files. System vulnerabilities leave veterans' PII susceptible to unauthorized disclosure. The improper transmission of veterans' records over an extended period of time by personnel at the National Personal Records Center, which exposed veterans' PII to potential compromise. The donation and surplus of laptops that were not degaussed or scrubbed, which in at least one case contained files of the former director of the Information Security and Oversight Office. Among these files was PII specific to national security officials from the Clinton administration. The loss or theft of hundreds of pieces of IT equipment written off for the period of fiscal year 2002 to 2006 that had capacity to store information. Inappropriate packaging of two backup hard drives containing limited PII at the FDR Presidential Library resulting in their loss during shipping. OIG investigators subsequently recovered one of the two. Additionally, this committee has recently notified of another incident in St. Louis, Missouri, in which failed hard drives from a drive array used to store PII information for thousands of federal employees inappropriately, inappropriately left NARA's physical control. The array contained mirrored images of office, official personnel files and related information of employees from three agencies. These cases worked by OIG staff within the past year are individually egregious and collectively represent an agency that is not meeting a core tenet of its mission to safeguard the records of our democracy. While each case of data breach, loss, of, loss or undue risk of loss represents a unique stanza, the chorus of the song remains the same. As an agency, NARA lacks a viable, robust risk identification and mitigation strategy, and we all pay for this shortcoming. In testimony before this committee on July 30th, I provided details as the internal control weaknesses which resulted in the loss of a hard drive containing two terabytes of Clinton presidential records. Internal control weaknesses, lapses, and exercises of questionable judgment tied to other incidents I have spoken of today regularly leave me and my staff frustrated and bewildered. Allow me to elaborate. Specific to the case involving the hard drive potentially holding millions of our nation's veterans PII, NARA officials con contracting for what to do with these type of hard drives initially had two choices. It needs to be clear that often there is nothing substantially wrong with failed drives and they are perfectly usable for many applications. Accordingly, one contract choice, the secure data option, would let NARA physically keep all drives identified as failing or failed. The second choice had the vendor provide a new drive, but then the vendor would take back that drive with the information on it. The vendor would then test the drive to see if anything was wrong with it, and if it was, it could be economically repaired and reused. However, if it cost more to fix than the drive was worth, the drive could be recycled for metals. NARA opted for choice two. Thus, NARA decided to allow the populated and potentially readable drive to leave NARA control. However, as drives actually started to fail, NARA was given a second chance to correct this decision and was presented with a third choice. NARA could keep the failed drive and pay approximately $2,000 for each new drive on a one-by-one -one basis. Unfortunately, NARA once again chose to let these populated drives leave their control. The trail specific to this drive was subsequently found to be untraceable and we cannot get possession back. Accordingly, I cannot tell the committee today whether a breach as defined by data being accessed by unauthorized parties actually occurred. But I can state emphatically that NARA's actions to create the risk of such a breach and the lack of due diligence to protect this information cannot be ignored and should not be marginalized. While I have been informed that this situation I just described has now been fixed contractually, I believe select NARA managers from the top down do not recognize the risk factors existing in today's environment. Failing to define the risk, we do not deploy 
and make the security first decisions necessary to address the real and potential risk before unfortunate and irreversible events transpire. In the brief time allotted to me, I would also note, specifically as it relates to the ERA program, that I have had professional skepticism about ERA since the very first meeting I attended in 2002. Fearing a worst case scenario, I went to then Archivist Carlin on April 30th, 2002, seeking audit staff resources to provide independent, objective, and skilled oversight over ERA. Per my notes, he responded, and I quote, I could give you 50 people and you still couldn't cover it, so you think you can do it with two? In December 2003, failing to obtain any ERA dedicated audit resources, I made a formal request to OMB director stating, and I quote, ERA is a challenge we are not equipped to address within our existing fiscal constraints. We are simply unable to provide the necessary coverage to this mission critical program. Failure to fund this initiative will not allow me to obtain persons with the skills necessary to independently evaluate and report upon the progress of ERA. Likewise, we will not be able to support this program in real time, potentially resulting in less than optimal results. This is a risk that this nation should not face. As I testify today, I continue to have profound concerns over the status of the ERA program. My concerns are rarely reflected by management who throughout program life have expressed abundant optimism. For example, in April 2007, a SARA meeting minutes, the ERA director stated, the technical director stated, that the program is succeeding, yet OIG auditors were finding this rosy scenario to be anything but the truth. In a management letter to the archivist on July 13, 2007, we accurately defined the ERA program as one, quote, beset by delivery delays, cost overruns, and staffing shakeups, unquote. History shows we were correct. At the very next ACERA meeting in November 2007, the minutes report that the same ERA technical director made a 100 degree course correction by defining that sound engineering methods were not followed in many areas. Lockheed allowed the schedule to become the priority rather than ensuring that requirements were being met in a satisfactory manner. Ultimately, this failed. Now we issued a curing notice to Lockheed in 2007. Shortly thereafter, in testimony before a subcommittee of the Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Government Affairs on May 14, 2008, Archivist Weinstein stated, quote, we, belatedly, we discovered belatedly that we may not have the A-team from Lockheed Martin, and Lockheed Martin acknowledged this fact. And so we got the A-team, and the A-team has been performing effectively. I am not sure as to the basis of this testimony, which was perhaps designed to allay the concerns espoused by senators at this hearing. Seventeen months have passed. We are now in fiscal year 2010, and key staff in NARA and LMC have come and gone. New voices replace old voices, and optimism ebbs and flows. At a time when NARA officials publicly voice confidence that full operating capability will be met by March 2012, a senior worker within the ERA program office spoke to me just last week of ongoing contracted performance and deliverable deficiencies. Perhaps the A team is sliding down the alphabetic scale. The acting office told me last week the chief information officer has been made aware of ongoing deficiencies. However, senior NARA management never brought such information to my attention nor disclose it to the orders assigned to this program area. As engaged as I have been, I do not know what capabilities and capacities will reside in ERA when the contractors throw another party, turn in their badges, shake hands, and exit the door. Such a statement should be viewed as troubling to all narrow stakeholders, and particularly this committee. It is my hope that through this testimony and with the support of a new archivist, we will begin to see improvements in our system of internal controls and that those who fail to discharge their duties will face appropriate sanctions. I thank you for this opportunity and look forward to responding to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Brockfield, for that testimony. Mr. Pounder, you're up. Uh, Chairman Clay, Ranking Member McHenry, and members of the subcommittee, we appreciate the opportunity to testify this afternoon on NAR's Electronic Records Archive system. This $550 million system is intended to preserve and provide access to massive amounts of electronic records and is an investment critical to NARA's mission. To date, NARA has spent more than half of the $550 million and has deployed two of the five planned increments. This afternoon, Chairman Clay, I'll comment on NARA's performance with the first two increments, existing project management concerns, plans for increments three through five, and recommendations for improvement. Starting with performance of the first two increments, increment one was late, over budget, and did not provide the functionality promised. Specifically, initial operating capability with four pilot agencies was scheduled for September 2007, but was delayed nine months to June 2008. 
This delay resulted in a cost overrun of $20 million, but even more troubling is the fact that planned functionality was not delivered and deferred to later increments. These delays also squashed NARA's plans to use ERA to receive the electronic presidential records of the outgoing Bush administration in January 2009. Instead, a separate commercial system with a different architecture from ERA was used to archive the Bush records. And although NARA certified the second increment in December of 2008, the 73 terabytes of presidential records were not ingested into the system until September 2009. The first two increments are basically different systems, and integrating these systems in later increments will need to be addressed. Managing a project of this, uh, this large requires sound project management discipline. That includes overseeing contractor performance to ensure that what the government is paying for is delivered at the agreed to cost and on time. To date, the ERA program does not have a good track record here, and when we looked into this last year, we found several weaknesses in NARA's practices. For example, we found contractor reports on program funds spent without work completed, and work completed and funds spent on work that was not in the work plans. NARA is working to improve these management processes so that the cost schedule and technical performance can be closely monitored in the remaining three increments over the next three years. Regarding the remaining three increments, we have reported and made recommendations to NARA that their out-year increments need to be clearly defined as to what specific functions will be delivered when and at what cost. For example, NARA has significant work ahead in the out-year increments that include expanding beyond the four pilot agencies, handling classified information, providing public access capability, and expanding functionality like access and preservation capabilities. Such detailed plans are essential if this project is to achieve full operating capability by 2012 at the $550 million price tag. Moving forward, NARA needs to closely monitor not only the cost and schedule of e each increment, but it also needs to monitor the functionality delivered. Our recommendation to bolster the program's use of earned value management should help if effectively implemented. The program also needs to ensure integration plans are in place to merge the differing architectures used in the era base system and the presidential record system. And also, NARA needs to define in great detail the functions to be delivered in increments three through five. This includes aligning detailed requirements and the costs with each increment. Failing to address these recommendations will clearly jeopardize the chances of achieving full operating capability by 2012. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement. Thank you for your oversight of this critical project, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Pounder. Mr. Brill, you, you have five minutes. Thank you, sir. Chairman Clay, Ranking Member McHenry, members of the committee and members of the staff, good afternoon. My name is Alan Brill. I'm currently Senior Managing Director for Secure Information Services at Coral On Track. I'm not here today as a representative of Coral On Track but as an individual to share whatever knowledge and experience I have in the fields of information security, data protection, and data recovery to assist the subcommittee with the vital work it performs. And I'm grateful to you, uh, to you for the opportunity to speak today. A substantial proportion of the information that is being created within our government is generated, exchanged, and stored digitally. It is produced and stored on computers ranging from the desktop or laptop computers of individuals to the massive processing arrays and networks of large agencies. It is also a simple fact that most of the data that is created and which may have historical import for extended periods of time will never in the course of normal use be printed. How do we safely and efficiently preserve electronic records when the technologies involved in producing and storing those records is clearly evolving at a breakneck, breakneck speed I've been involved in the security and recovery of data from computers for more than 40 years. My recent experience has involved working with private sector organizations to safeguard sensitive data and help those organizations respond to data security incidents. I've learned a few lessons that I hope will be helpful to the subcommittee when it considers how best to carry out its oversight role in assuring the preservation of electronic records, which are a vital part of our national heritage. First. 
Don't assume that the devices currently used to store data will be commonly used or even reasonably available in the future. Above all else, we must ensure not only that we can store the data, but that we can completely and accurately access it on the physical media that we preserve. This means that we either have to also preserve workable reading mechanisms or periodically transfer the data to contemporary storage media as new storage technology obsoletes the old. Second, don't assume that data can't be restored even if the storage medium appears to be damaged. Consider a quick example. Following the tragic loss of the Space Shuttle Columbia in 2003, NASA located a hard drive in the debris field. The Glenn Research Center sent it to my organization for examination. Although the, exam the electronics on that drive had been literally fried, the case burned and plastic from the innards of the device had melted onto the surface of the drives, we were able to rebuild the mechanical components, clean the disk, and recover over 99% of the data, which turned out to be vital for completing a long-term experiment in basic physics. With today's technology, unless the media containing the data is utterly destroyed, the data is at least potentially recoverable. I believe that the best practice is that when a device contains sensitive data, assume that it might be potentially recoverable, unless you've taken proper steps to render that data permanently unreadable. Third, what you see is very often not all that you can get. There are a number of data fields that are automatically created and maintained by the programs that all of us use. Some are obvious the date and time that a file was originally written, how many times it was edited, when it was last opened, but it can contain more. It may contain a record of changes made in the course of revision and review. Now, This information is called metadata, and it's important to the understanding of the file with which it's associated. People think that things like this are a brand new issue, Mr. Chairman, but they're not. If you look at Abraham Lincoln's handwritten manuscript of the Gettysburg Address, you can see how he edited it, what it looked like before he made the changes, what he crossed out, what he added. And the same can often be done with digital records through examination of the metadata, but only if that metadata is preserved. Unfortunately, unless care is taken in regard to the preservation process, metadata can inadvertently be changed or lost. To ignore metadata is to constrain future understanding of the file. Next. Ensuring data security must be more than an afterthought. There is a cost to data protection, but planned effectively, those costs can be controlled. There will always be a trade-off between cost and protection. Now, while I'm not an expert in the various security standards that are used by federal agencies, I found that there are a number of centers of knowledge which can be of immense value in understanding the risks and the alternatives. The work of the professionals at NIST come to mind. I have no doubt that this subcommittee is aware of the ongoing work there to identify risks, protective measures, and to provide publications that help professionals and managers in both the public and private sector to do a better job of securing sensitive data. Sir, the cost of not protecting data appropriately can be very, very high. What is the cost to future knowledge if electronic records of today's decisions and activities are lost through security failures? I believe that the expertise exists to assist and advise our government on this complex and continually changing issue. There are many specialists like myself who recognize that service on advisory councils and other appropriate mechanisms is really part of our civic and professional personal duty. Why not call on this pool of knowledge? If we don't collect data and collect it properly, if we don't maintain it in a usable and complete form, and if we don't safeguard it appropriately, it won't be there for the benefit of future generations. Finally, we must assure that both public and private sector organizations have a plan for exactly what they will do if there is a data protection incident. Trying to develop a crisis management plan in the middle of a crisis is difficult at best. Recognizing that incidents can occur and that they do occur is far more effective in terms of responding to the incident. I want to thank the subcommittee for inviting me here today. Sir, over the years, I've had the opportunity to work with information security professionals in government, at the FBI, the Defense Department, the Secret Service. I'm very proud of the work that they do. Their public service in a time when they could earn far more in the private sector 
is a measure of devotion. Anything that we in the private sector can do to add to the knowledge, to make sure that we keep up with the changes, is more than just something that could be done. It's something that ought to be done. Thank you very much for inviting me here today, sir. Thank you, too, Mr. Brill, especially for your passion in regard to this subject. And we appreciate your service and uh, thank the entire panel for their testimony. Uh, I also want to welcome uh, our newest member to the subcommittee, uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Henry Cuellar. Welcome aboard, and we look forward to your involvement in the subcommittee. And we will go into the question and answer period, and we will recognize the gentleman uh, from Ohio for five minutes to begin the questioning. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I, I thank you for calling this hearing, and I appreciate very much the testimony. Uh, this certainly hits home to me. I remember when I was a state representative and one of my colleagues called me and uh, recited my Social Security number to me. Uh, after looking at a, a county, uh, I believe it was the, the county auditor or the county recorder or something like that, the clerk of courts, um, who, whose son had developed a new website. And, and they decided it would be great if we scanned every document in, in the county uh, that came be through the clerk of courts and, and they scanned it onto the website, not thinking that, you know, perhaps some of these parking tickets uh, that were out there or some, and mine was a traffic violation, uh, contained some sensitive information. And, but what it, what it brought to mind was that there was no standard operating procedure at all uh, in the county, uh, in the state, uh, anywhere when it came to not just archiving the data, but dealing with the data at all. And, and so, Mr. Brockfeld, when I hear your testimony, it, it strikes me as very concerning. And earlier this year, uh, I introduced legislation dealing with classification of documents because there's no standard operating procedure in the federal government when it comes to standard, you know, classifications. We find that, you know, the, the federal government exists in silos, and there are different standard operating procedures when it deals to just classifying documents and, and classifying certain information. So if you could help me, Mr. Brockfeld, I'm very interested, or, or any of you, as to our status uh, as a federal government in terms of coming up with standard procedures for dealing with sensitive documentation and sensitive information. Not only how do we collect it, but then how is it uh, how is it dealt with? And certainly when it's archived, you know, how do we then deal with its archive? Give us a score as to how we are in standardizing this uh, as a process. Actually, the focus of my work is doing investigations and audits in terms of policy and procedures and classification of documents. That's not my ballywick. Well, not just classification, but I'm talking about uh, the, the sensitive information that you were talking about, you know, and, and how vulnerable we are. Uh, to losing that information. It strikes me that within departments, we don't have standard operating procedures to, to deal with this appropriately. And I'm wondering if you have any observations as to how far we've come uh, or how far we still have to go in terms of the various departments in collecting and then classifying and archiving that data. I think there are standards available. For example, in the cases I was talking about specific to the loss of data and the breach of data, there is, as, as Mr. Brill noted as well, there's NIST standards, OMB puts out regulations, requirements, agencies establish and define their own internal requirements. The problem is it shouldn't just be a paper exercise where you can hold up to the world that we have policies, we have procedures, and then you can put your head on your pillow and think that you can rest assured. No, you have to actually train people. You actually have to hold people to those standards. You have to test. You have to drill down. You have to ensure that they're being enforced and protected at all times. And I think that's what happens many times in federal agencies, at least through my 30 years now of experience, which is that it's, actually, it's easy to write policy, and especially in this day and age, it's easy to get contractors and pay them to write policy for you. But to actually instill that work ethic, to actually instill those morals, to actually enforce the proper treatment of records and protection of records, that's the problem. And that's where, in my testimony, I talk about where I believe that NARA has fallen short in terms of 
lack of training, lack of oversight, and then lack of appropriate action when people violate narrow policy and procedures, which were drafted in response to OMB regulations and requirements. So we don't have a pass and we don't have a buy. These are things we should be doing, and these are things that we fail to do at the National Archives. So, so it's not just a, a matter of, of standardization. It's a matter of following through and making sure that the processes are, are being followed and then enforced if they're not being followed. That's correct, and that's why as an Inspector General, first of all, I'm very happy to be testifying today and get the attention of this subject, and I'm also proud of my staff that we're putting forward very sound recommendations that should management opt to accept them and adopt them, I think will bring in far, far increased levels of internal control security, and maybe we won't be here next year talking about further breaches. Maybe we'll actually have a pretty tight shop if we do some of the stuff we're recommending. Well, I guess following up on the issue of holding people accountable, Ms. Thomas, when you were here in July uh, with regard to the theft of, of the Clinton administration hard drive, uh, you at the time stated that you would act with swift and appropriate disciplinary action if, if, in, if we found out that there were people to be held accountable. Have you followed up on that and what steps have been taken? Well, at this point in time, we have held off on taking disciplinary actions, although we are ready to do so, basically at the request of the Inspector General so that they can finish their investigation. But once that is, is finished and, we've given, and they give us the go-ahead, then disciplinary actions will be taken. So the disciplinary action is pending? Pending. Okay. That's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Treehouse. Uh, Mr. McHenry. You may proceed for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Thomas, how long have you been in your current position? As acting archivist? Yes. Uh, since mid-December of last year. Okay. Uh, and I ask that just for context, so that is on the record. Um, you know, I, I, this committee, and I don't think Congress looks at you as the culprit here, uh, but we're asking for your assistance um, in well, in light of the fact that the Senate has not acted upon uh, the President's nomination um, of the next archivist of the United States. Um, but having said that, what policies have you changed in light of this additional security breach uh, with the loss of these veterans' records? Um, Mr. Congressman, I think I have to say that our own determination is that we uh, used a government-wide contract that other agencies use that had the appropriate privacy protections written into the contract, and so that our use of that contract was a valid uh, way of sending back a disk. Now, we've decided that we need to go beyond what's acceptable, and we've adopted a policy the CIO has of not sending disks back to uh, the vendor. But we do not believe that any breach has actually occurred because the material was in the hands of authorized people all along the process. Okay, so you have changed policy and that you don't send out, uh, if I may finish. So, I'm sorry. You know, the two choices, uh, Mr. Bradfield, uh, you testified the two choices were to secure the data and keep uh, even a failed disk on hand, um, or send it back, replace it. Uh, those were the two choices. Now you've switched. Is that correct? The new policy that's been adopted or in place by the CIO is that we will not send any disks back to the contractor. Okay. Uh, Ms. Bradfield, um, thank you for your testimony. Uh, you've always been very direct, um, and as all inspector generals are, are, are supposed to be, and we certainly appreciate your work. Um, has the has your office um, uh, commented previously uh, about this policy of, uh, of sending these drives out uh, to contractors and getting them back? Well, it simply should never have happened. Um, if I'll let me read you a sentence sure. or two. This is what Dell. One of the contractors. The most recent case is Dell. This is what Dell said. Dell assumes no responsibility for the destruction of data returned on such drives. Dell strongly encourages you to remove all confidential, proprietary, or personal information from any storage device before it is returned to Dell. We didn't do that. I brought with me a properly scrubbed, sanitized, dot. this is a drive right here. 
This drive, let's, for the purposes of this hearing, this drive has veterans information for millions of veterans. What the, once it, it's mobile. I'm carrying it. It is a mobile device. It's game, set, match. If you go to NIST standards, if you go to OMB requirements, if you go to NARA's own internal policy and procedures, once you have PII data stored on a mobile device, it must be encrypted. Before, at, must be encrypted, simple fact. Furthermore, should you ship that and lose custody or give up custody or control, it must be scrubbed, wiped, degaussed. In neither cases that we're talking about today was that done. This data went out. Now, it's true. There is a language, boilerplate language, that NARA found about three, four weeks ago in a contract. And that's what they're feeling comfortable in telling you, that the vendor, once they receive this drive, were supposed to maintain the confidentiality of the data. But let's go with the first case, the CMRS drive. It didn't go to just one vendor. It went to two, then three, then four. It followed a food chain. First, it went back to the company that we had a contract with. They sent it to another company to analyze the data on the drive and see if, in fact, the drive sectors failed. That, then it went to another company. And finally, the fourth stop was a scrap company for the metal scrap. Now, that's pretty far down the food chain to lose control. We don't know who had access to that within that company. We don't know if it was stored physically in a safe location. We don't know if somebody was embedded in one of those companies that might see this as an opportunity to find social security numbers or mine whatever data came their way for profit, we, national security, et cetera. We don't know. So the, what the National Archives did is violated their own policy, which is derived from NIST standards and OMB regulations and lost control of millions of veterans' files and records, and now in the most recent case, thousands of federal employees. Those are the simple facts. Well, thank you, Mr. Bradfield. Uh, now, you, you had, there was originally veterans' data on that. What process did you go to, or is that currently encrypted, or did you delete the information from that file? The, the, this, this is a, this drive did not, I, I'm very careful. I, I am careful about what I do. This drive, I have the proper certifications to, before I would leave the building with this, that it was wiped, and I have the technology that was used to wipe the drive. I have it certified that it has no information on it at this point. It's clear, and no, and again, Mr. Brill, okay, Mr. Mr. Brill. Right. It had no Could data your company on it. retrieve data off of that quote-unquote wiped uh, hard drive? Sir, if the drive is wiped properly and completely, the answer is generally you cannot. Here's the problem. There is a big difference between I believe I've wiped the drive and I've wiped the drive. We find, for example, that uh, organizations uh, sometimes discover that a disgruntled employee may have run a wiping program to get rid of data uh, that would incriminate them. But not all wiping programs are created equally effectively. And some of them work very, very well. Some of them work not well at all. That's why it's, it's important not just to say wipe the drive, but as, as I think the Inspector General has suggested, that it be wiped in a forensically acceptable way and possibly tested afterwards to make sure that when we say there's no data, that in fact there's no data. Okay. Thank you for your testimony. I certainly appreciate it. And I don't think this is necessarily about con contractors, I think is Mr. Bratchfield's point. It's about a secure chain of possession of sensitive information. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, I, I think this is a larger cultural issue uh, with the archives uh, in terms of um, employee satisfaction and following basic procedures, and, and uh, certainly appreciate your leadership in making sure that we have good oversight of this to make sure we correct this. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. McHenry, for your line of questioning. Uh, Mr. Cuellar is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Thomas, let me ask you, just looking at the big picture, uh, looking at this hindsight, what do you think the weaknesses are in this IT security? And, and uh, also, as uh, the colleague just mentioned, when you look at not only in your area, but the, the food chain or the custody down, down the line. What, uh, I mean, just tell me overall, what, what do you think the weaknesses are? Well, I think one of the things that's happening is that, as Mr. Brill has, has sort of alluded to, 
technology is moving at such a fast pace that things, processes and procedures that were acceptable six months ago may not be acceptable today. I, can, I know that when I moved to Virginia 30 years ago, my driver's license number was my social security number. I think our social security numbers were used on a lot of documentation. You were asked to, when you wrote a check, write your, your driver's license number on it. That was your social security number. When all of the information, not all the information, but a good deal of the information became electronic and much easier to manipulate and use in nefarious ways, and in all of the data was in a more concentrated uh, small device like Paul has mentioned, it's becoming more and more of a challenge to deal in, with that and to protect that information. So our procedures, our policies have to catch up to the reality of today and continuously change as technology changes. You said uh, we got to get our policies to try, uh, I'm looking at the word try to catch up. Are you caught up? I think we are at the moment, but as, as Mr. Brill has said, technology tomorrow, I don't know. Okay. But you should have something in, in place that should let yes. you keep up with and we those. certainly, that's what the administration is doing, that's what OMB is doing, NIST is doing, and we're following those procedures. All right, uh, let's talk about the internal audit that you conducted on your IT security. Um, what was that performed and by whom? Uh, they had a we had a contractor, SAIC, come in and review all of our IT security. When was that? Was this past year. Okay, what was the conclusion? Well, they came up with a, a series of recommendations. I think I said 29 recommendations, at least 29, uh, all of which we are have uh, are working to implement. Most of them have been by now, and we're uh, working on all of them. Out of 29, how many have been implemented? I would have to uh, provide that for the record. I don't know how many. You don't know right now how many have been implemented? I do not know. I know it is more than 50 percent, probably more like three quarters. Okay. Um, you can see how that can be a problem. If, if, if you do an internal audit to see what your weaknesses are and we have an implement, uh, how long would it take you to implement 100 percent of the um, recommendations, the 29 recommendations? Uh, I know that, they're, that the CIO is working on implementing all of the recommendations, and I am uh, going to uh, say that within the next six months, and I may have to correct that after I talk to the CIO. I'm sorry. So if we're going to try to keep up with the changes that you mentioned, have your policy to keep up, we got to wait another six months to implement those? These. These are identified weaknesses which we are trying to correct in all instances. Some are more serious than others. Those are the ones that we had tackled first. Okay. All right. Well, let me ask you, uh, Mr. Brackfield, uh, was this, in fact, an audit and who performed it? It technically was not, cannot be considered an audit. It was performed by SAIC under what's called a Program Review for Information Service Management Assistance. It's called PRISMA. Um, it was, so it's not technically allowed to be called an audit. It was not an audit. It does not, in fact, SAIC in their PRISMA report specifically states that it's not an audit. What would you classify that? It's a review that was done on the, for, for management. Um, in addition to the audit work that we do, where we've determined that IT security is a material weakness, management opted to get a second opinion, so to speak, and contracted for, a, for SAIC to do that work. They came out with a finding of 29 I believe it was weaknesses that they identified. Now you you have reviewed those uh, uh, that matter. Uh, do you know how many of the 29 recommendations uh, Naira has implemented? My auditors, who I have my IT auditors, who I have tremendous amount of faith on, in and who have been right throughout in terms of their analysis, determined that 27 of the 29 have not been adopted to date. Okay. We believe that only two have been closed out and completed to our satisfaction. Mr. Chairman, can I just follow up on yeah? 27 out of the 29 have not been implemented? That was reported on September, I believe, 9th or 20th. It was reported just this past month to management. 
our, our, we put together a matrix defining why we believe 27 to 29 had not been corrected. We requested a meeting in September to discuss this, and it's now November 5th, and our request for a meeting has not been addressed. And the question, Mr. Chairman, was, uh, I believe Ms. Th Thomas' uh, testimony was that more than half or three-quarters have been implemented, and, and Mr. Brackfield saying that, according to his folks, is that only two have been implemented, and the meeting has not been set up, and I find that a little disturbing. Th Sounds like there's Thank some you, Mr. discrepancy. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Let me, uh, Ms. Thomas, you um, assured this subcommittee in July that in regard to the theft or loss of the Clinton administration hard drive, you would act with swift and appropriate disciplinary action. Uh, have you made your determinations as to the causes of the theft or loss uh, and what specific actions have you taken? The uh, determination of what, how the uh, hard drive was, was, went missing, was stolen, is an investigatory responsibility of the Inspector General. So we are waiting for the investigation to be complete. We have, however, determined that there were certainly internal control weaknesses that allowed whatever happened to happen, and we have made substantial changes in the way the controls of the equipment, who can have access to it, uh, and we are ready to take disciplinary action against those people who were not following existing policy, but we are waiting for the end of the investigation. You could take action now in your We agency. have been requested not to by the Inspector General. Yes, but we could take action now were it not for that standing request. Mr. Powder, is, uh, is it complete? Uh, Mr. Bra Brackfail, is it complete? I am, the, the investigation, get, your question is, is the investigation complete? No. We are actively investigating. We have new information, which I cannot discuss publicly at this open hearing, but we do have progress in our investigation. And as, do, as the nature of the investigation is extremely sensitive, um, we, and the acting archivist is correct, we respectfully requested whether, you know, we've respectfully requested that they hold off because we don't want to do anything at this point that could damage our investigation. So in that case, that is correct. We have respectfully requested that disciplinary action be held back pending the furtherance of our investigation or in support of our investigation. Okay, thank you for that response. Mr. Pounder, um, can you estimate the cost of uh, integrating increments one and two uh, down the line. I mean, you stated that it was a project at $550 million. Right, $550 million life cycle cost. Uh, we spent about half of that to date. Uh, we do not have clear integration costs going forward. Well, here, here's, here's the problem, not only with the integration costs going forward, but when you look at the out year increments, three, four, and five, how we're going to allocate the remaining money, there's a serious question with the remaining money to be spent, including those integration costs, whether we're going to get a full operational capability by 2012. If you look at the track record to date, I think it's, the answer is likely no. And so what we want to see is real clear plans for the next three increments and exactly what's going to be delivered so we can measure to that. You know, this is, is similar in cost, Mr. Chairman. We were here a year ago talking about FIDCA. Yeah. That was a $500 million contract at one time, a system at one time, that doubled quickly. Sure. Okay, we want to avoid a situation like that. Uh, has, has there been a... Uh I guess we'll call it a cavalier attitude with taxpayers' money in this instance. I wouldn't say that, but I would say that the management discipline that we would like to see from the government is clearly not where we want it to be. And I'll give you an example where we looked at these contractor reports and we see contractor reports where they're spending money, receiving funds, but not getting the work done. Um, you know, there's a program management technique that's OMB endorses called Earned Value Management. We look at those reports and scrub them, and 
what we need here is we need the program office to pay close attention to those reports so that we're overseeing the contractor and the government's in charge, not the contractor. Would you uh, supply this committee with a, a um, summary report of the spending to this date and what problems you see uh, are on the horizon as far as the spending is concerned uh, with this program. Yes, we can do that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. And, and, and I noticed that um, you may have wanted to get in on the um, discussion earlier on whether there are industry standards uh, that NARA could use that would that would have helped this situation. Did you have a comment? Well, the one comment on the uh, multiple classifications, GAO has done a lot of work on sensitive but unclassified data. This is dated, but you know, two to two to three years ago, there were over 70 classifications of sensitive but unclassified data. And I think the quick answer to the congressman's question is consolidating those many classifications is a clear work in progress, and it's incomplete. Thank you for that response. Mr. Brill, any comment on industry, industry standards? I think if there's, if there's anything to be said about industry standards, there's a recognition that the more complex you make any program, the more likely you are to have problems. If you can keep things simple, if you can classify things in a limited number of buckets, and you have some clear rules about what to do in each case, then it is much more likely that you're going to have a very high degree of success in that program. We see all the time, you know, my work is kind of divided in two, sir. In some cases, we're brought in in advance to try to avoid problems. But in a lot of cases, we're the, the firemen, we're the guys who get the call when something terrible happens. And I, and I think it would be fair to, to tell you that when that happens, we can end up in most cases, classifying the incident into one of two major buckets. One is, it happened. The other is, it happened, but it shouldn't have happened. That it was an avoidable problem. That if rules had been followed, if standards had been followed, if, for example, something as simple as a patch from a vendor had been applied to a computer, wouldn't have happened. Uh, if a firewall was properly configured, wouldn't have happened. If we can manage those, if we can avoid the avoidable incidents by simplification, by good management, by good follow-up, by good audits, that's key. There will always be incidents. Human beings will always make mistakes. Machines are not infallible. So rather than, than sometimes throwing up our hands and saying things happen, let's classify it simply. Let's stop the things that we can reasonably prevent through what I consider a commercially reasonable set of controls. Have plans in place for what we're gonna do if something happens in spite of our best efforts and recognize, as everybody has said here, that the environment changes. The first computer that I used at the Pentagon back in 1968 had 2,000 positions of memory, 2K. The systems in my office now are measured not in kilobytes, but in petabytes. And one petabyte is a million gigabytes. The vast amounts of data mean that we have to treat it in a systematic fashion. Those who figure out how to do that, how to build the security into the network, build it into the systems, tend to have fewer mistakes. And the mistakes that occur don't fall into that tragic category of, we could have prevented this. Thank you so much. Uh, the gentlewoman from California is recognized for five Thank minutes. you so Ms. much, Watson. Mr. Chairman. And uh, I came in late, and probably a lot of this has been already discussed. But um, what would each one of you recommend after the investigation into the breaches into the delays and so on, what would you recommend as we move forward? Because this valuable information that's stored in the archives, if there are breaches or if the 
uh, mach machinery in some way collapses, what kind of backup systems do we need to have? What do we need to build into our base equipment? So as you said, Mr. Brill, these things should not have happened. Can any of you look forward and tell us what you would like to see? I guess I'll tackle. Brave, bold. <laughs> It's my nature, what can I do? Um, no, I, I, there's two different issues here. In terms of the breaches and the events that transpired, right. I think that if you look at NARA today, we have policy and procedures that are defined because they've been derived from NIST and OMB. So we, got, we have that piece of the equation. The question that we move forward now is ensuring through training and oversight that there's compliance with that, those requirements and, as appropriate, punishment. Because those regulations, which are on our books, which are in our requirements, say that if people violate the security provisions, appropriate administrative and potentially criminal action, criminal um, charges. Who should do the oversight? I'm sorry? Who should do the oversight? The agency is the program. I'm not a program official. I do audits and investigations. The agency is in charge with oversight of programs and ensuring that their programs are implemented and, and successful. So the agency needs to, to do that piece of the puzzle. I'm there to provide whatever guidance and support I can in that regard. And should somebody or an entity fail to live up to their requirements, I'm there to do investigations. And if it turns criminal, I'm there to do the criminal investigations and my staff. Mm -hmm. Who determines there should be an investigation? Who, who's responsibility would that be? Well, that, that's my decision. If I'm, if I'm alerted to a, uh, it happens all the time. We get hotline calls, we get people coming to us, we get formal referrals. Once my office becomes aware of an event or events, we make a decision, my Assistant Inspector General for Audits and Assistant Inspector General for Investigations, we work the issue, we make determinations. If we believe it's potential for criminal, we work with the Department of Justice as we're required by law to do. If we believe it's administrative, we take a different track. Or if we believe that nothing inappropriate happened and it's not my responsibility in that regard, we may just do a referral. But it, it weighs on my shoulders and we address that. Mr. Brill, um, you were mentioning that we should have standards. What should we do in order to avoid these kinds of problems? Well, breaches, I don't know what you would do, but what would you suggest? It's as good a word as any, I suspect. You know, it's an interesting thing. I was, I've been sitting here thinking about something, and, and it's this. Back in about 1975, uh, I was an uh, Army Reserve officer. I uh, served active in reserve for 38 years. Um, and I was assigned to the Office of the Secretary of Defense as a mobilization designee. And we started looking, even back then, at information security. And I remember a meeting that I had with the then Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Audits. And I had just um, successfully compromised a data center uh, that I'd been requested to test out. And what I said to him was this, how can you, how can you go before Congress and have to say that the standards that you're using maybe would not be acceptable in a major corporation. You know, I work with corporations, primarily not governments, but what I found is there is an evolution. The standards that have come out, the internal controls, as, as the Inspector General has said, uh, following things like Sarbanes-Oxley, following the, the changes in governance, in the corporate world have changed things. The changes that occurred in 2006 when the federal rules of civil procedure were modified as a result of the work of the Sedona Conference to recognize the importance of digital records in the civil litigation process. There's been a sea change. People are realizing that the key to this is good management. It's no different than it was 100 years ago. When we had paper records we could preserve them, but that didn't mean they were going to be readable unless we preserved them properly and we protected them properly. Digital records are no different. The techniques vary, but the principles are the same. And isn't it always the same, ma'am, that, that responsibility has to be taken, somebody has to be 
the person that you can talk to about it and that there are standards, whether we use the ISO standards, whether we use the, the good work that's been done at NIST, whether we use the uh, standards of other organizations. I don't really care what standard there are. But if we have a standard and we all agree to it, then an agency knows what to do. You know what you can ask them. The auditors know that it's a fair game, that, that you're testing on the basis of rules. So I think what I'm seeing is that just as corporations have recognized that the way that they handled automated records in the past is no longer acceptable. It, if you did what you did a few years ago, you're likely to find a judge uh, holding that you've committed spoliation and, and that there can be penalties for that. Just as I said to the, the guy at the Defense Department years ago, I think that if we're lucky as citizens, there's a two-way street between the private sector and the public sector in terms of exchanging knowledge, research that's done, best practices. And to the extent that that, that can be done, I think there's great value to be had. Let's see what some of the best run companies are doing. Let's see why the, the, the standards are changing. Let's see what's being done. I think the real key in, in getting that information is perhaps the simplest thing that anyone can do. And I can express it in one word, ask. Thank you, Ms. Jiren. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Watson. Um, just as a final question, Ms. Thomas, at a hearing last month, uh, we heard about your advisory committee on the, the electronic records archives. Uh, NARA believes that the advisory committee has been valuable in providing outside expert advice in the development of ERA. Its members represent expertise in an extremely wide range of, of areas. Uh, however, as far as we can tell, the committee does not include one expert or even anyone with direct experience in the area of information technology security. Uh, why isn't this, in, this important field represented uh, on your advisory committee? I don't know that the, whether there is any specific person whose profession is information security. I think all of the members who have responsibility for systems certainly have responsibility for information security security over those systems and therefore come to the committee with with a wealth of experience in how they deal with their own systems well do they bring a a, uh, a knowledge of information security like for instance uh, your fellow panelist, Mr. Brill, who I apparently think Mr. Brill's been, unique. <laughs> I do too, but, <laughs> but I mean, there, there has to be, I mean, just to have someone. I uh, think that's a compliment, Mr. Brill. It is, yes, it, it is. I'm just certainly to have someone that represent <laughs> that uh, aspect of information technology would be probably helpful to the advisory committee. I think you're probably right, Mr. Chairman, and we can certainly look at the membership, and if, if, it, if we are deficient in that, having that kind of person, uh, maybe Mr. Brill would even like to join ACERA. We'll let you and Mr. Brill okay. discuss that. If there are no other questions, um, hearing is adjourned. Thank you so much. Thank you.